Serbs, Croats, and Muslims argue today about a newly drawn map of Bosnia at peace talks in Geneva. The latest UN compromise would give the Serbs more than half the country, the Muslims about a third, and the Croats less than a fifth. On the ground, though, the three sides are still trying to redraw the map by force. Barry Peterson is on the scene of the heaviest fighting in central Bosnia. Mostar last night, alive with gunfire and the thunder of artillery between Muslims and Croats. The Croats want Mostar as the capital of their slice of Bosnia. The Muslims are fighting desperately to keep their town. It's their route to the sea. By daylight, the damage is clear. Houses that have been burned out. Half of a cotton factory now useless debris. The Muslims are in the valley below. They can't come this direction because the Serbs hold the line. The Croats are coming at them from the hill across the way, so the Muslims in between are being squeezed. Efforts to help the Muslims, like this UN convoy, are turned back by the Croats. Food is a weapon in this war. The fighting and destruction stretch for miles up and down a once beautiful land, fast becoming Bosnia's Death Valley. I and my soldiers uh, hope uh, that uh, this war uh, will be over in short future, but uh, it is only hope. In Turnovo, the fighting is over, but there will be no easy peace. The Serbs burned out the Muslims, then the Muslims took control and burned out the Serbs. This is what's left. Miljana is Serb, born and raised here. Her house is gutted. Yes, I think it can be a city again if the war finish soon, if the people come back. It will be better, she promises her neighbors, but she wonders if peace can turn enemies back into friends. Some of them will be my friends again. But I'm not sure that they will come back. I'm not sure. The Serbs blasted the mosque. The Muslims burned the church. With hatred that deep, it may take forever to forgive and forget. Barry Peterson, CBS News, Turnovo. Israel's chief judge today refused to free John Demyanyuk, even though a court ruled three weeks ago that he was not Ivan the Terrible from a Nazi death camp. Demyanyuk's family wants to take him home to Ohio, but some Israelis want to try him again for different war crimes. The judge gave him 15 days to argue for a new trial. Still to come on tonight's CBS Evening News, Eye on America. Tonight, murder and mystery, the makings of a bestseller and a real-life nightmare. 18 years ago, in a wealthy Connecticut suburb, a teenage girl was murdered. Tonight, the case is still open. And while it takes facts to drive a criminal investigation, fiction may give this one a jump start. Correspondent Bob Faw has the story in tonight's Eye on America. Martha Moxley was only 15, pretty and popular, until Halloween Eve 1975, when she was brutally murdered beaten repeatedly with a golf club and stabbed in her front yard in Greenwich, Connecticut. A world of wealth and privilege grieved, but no one was ever convicted of her murder. No one, her mother Dorothy recalls, was even arrested. And when you realize how savagely she was murdered, it was just, it was terrible. You know, makes it worse. The chief suspect then was Tommy Skakel, son of a wealthy businessman and Ethel Kennedy's nephew. He was the last person known to see Martha Moxley alive, and the golf club which killed her was found at his home. There were several suspects early on, and through investigation, we eliminated them and then zeroed in on Tommy. Retired Detective Stephen Carroll was an original investigator on the case. Thomas Skakel murdered. Well, this is what we theorize. Is there any doubt in your mind? No. There just wasn't enough evidence. You, you, you know, you, in your heart and soul, you know, that son of a did it. But you, uh, you can't prove it. Your client, Thomas Skakel, did he kill Martha Moxley? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Skakel, who passed a lie detector test, and his family, which originally cooperated with the police, have virtually stonewalled investigators for more than 17 years, angering Martha's brother, John. It just doesn't make any sense. And the fact that they are not talking tells you they must be hiding something. Best-selling novelist Dominic Dunn feels the same way. In his latest book, a young man, very much like Tom Skakel, kills a girl very much like Martha Moxley. 
almost all my things deal with rich and powerful people getting away with stuff that ordinary people don't get away with. And does that drive me crazy? It does. There is another reason Dominic Dunn could not forget Martha Moxley. What's happening? Nearly 11 years ago, Dunn's own daughter, 25-year-old actress Dominique Dunn, was also brutally murdered, also on Halloween Eve. Her killer spent only three years in jail. The rage that Dunn felt over what happened to them drove him to complete his latest work. No justice for my daughter, says Dunn, nor for Martha Moxley. The reason I feel so passionate about this is that, you know, all these years, there seemed to be much more attention paid to protecting people who might be guilty than to considering what has happened to this, to this young girl. Nearly 18 years later, the unsolved murder is still so sensitive here in Greenwich that local police and prosecutors refuse to sit down and talk about it with CBS News. Dominic Dunn, though, was not so bashful. He says police botched the case, either because they were inept or because they were intimidated by the powerful Skakel family. Dunn says that his book has triggered several new leads, which he's already given police. His critics say Dunn does not know where fact ends and fiction begins. I don't think it's, it's, this is helping to, to just continue to stir up these codes, to continue to stir up these awful memories. That sentiment just makes me want to puke. A girl is dead. A girl is dead. I mean, that's, that's what I keep saying. And nearly 18 years later, a mother can only hope that a bestseller yields something which no investigation has. I live with it every day, and it will always be with me, always be with John. Uh, we just need some closure. A resolution. Mm -hmm. In Greenwich, Connecticut, this is Bob Fall for Eye on America. D.C. stands for District of Columbia, but soon it could stand for Deal the Cards. Want to bet? Jim Stewart has the action. Think Washington, and this is what comes to mind. History, tradition, all those grand old monuments and that grand old flag. Until this morning, anyway, when residents awoke to the news that City Hall wants to put a big casino in the Capitol. The mayor came up with the plan, and Councilman Jack Evans thinks it's a fine idea, too. Something tasteful, of course. We would try and avoid the tacky situation of having a model White House with pictures of the president flashing outside. That's not what we have in mind. Hopefully, it's something much more tasteful than that. What's going on here is that the District of Columbia is broke. It's laying off firemen and policemen, and it wants to build a brand new convention center for which it doesn't have any money. So why not do what so many other cities have done lately and just roll the dice? New Orleans recently approved a casino in riverboat gambling, as have many smaller towns. 20 million tourists a year come to Washington anyway, the thinking goes. Maybe they'd like to try their luck. Then again, maybe not. It would corrupt things more than uh, some of the politicians as it is. Yeah. <laughs> I think if we wanted to go to, to come here for gambling, we'd have gone to Las Vegas. I think that with um, Las Vegas, it's enough. Well, if you don't mix it. I mean, yeah. you're going to keep the gambling separate. I don't expect to find a, a casino in front of the uh, <laughs> Lincoln Memorial or the Washington Monument. Neither, it would seem, would Mr. Washington, who once wrote, gambling is the child of avarice, the brother of iniquity, and the father of mischief. Besides, Congress would have to approve gambling here, and odds are 99 to 1 they won't. Jim Stewart, CBS News, Washington. You can bet on it. And that's our news. Bob Schieffer will be here tomorrow. Harry Smith and Paul Azan on Sunday. I'm Connie Chung. I'll see you again on Monday. Thank you for joining us and for Dan Rather and all of us at CBS News. Have a great weekend.